We get started here. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to the uh, November 2nd, 2023 Des Moines Area Metropolitan Planning Organization Transportation Technical Committee. Uh, my name is Steve Neighbor, City Engineer for the City of Des Moines, as chair. Uh, we'll call this November 2nd meeting to order. Uh, that will start right into item number two, uh, a vote on looking for a motion to uh, an approval, a second to approve the agenda. Got the agenda up on the screen. On Toy, I'll move approval. Thanks, Louise. Second, Miller. Thanks, Mark. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Uh, again, we are meeting the meeting virtually today, so we were not going to have everyone unmute and say aye. We'll just ask that anyone opposed uh, to the motion, please speak up. Uh, and so uh, is there, we got a, a motion and a second. Is there any discussion or questions on the agenda? Okay, is anyone opposed to the motion? Hearing none, that uh, motion passes. That brings us to item three, uh, uh, looking for a motion and a second on the approval of the meeting minutes from the October 5th, 2023 meeting. Can you get a motion and a second, please? Oh, motion to approve, Miller. Thanks, Mark. I did, Rudy. Thanks, Rudy. All right, we got a motion and a second. Is there any questions or any discussion on the minutes that have been posted? Okay, is there any here now? Is there anyone opposed? Opposed to the motion. Okay, hearing none, item three uh, passes. That brings us to item number four, a presentation uh, update on Highway 141 corridor study. Uh, uh, looks like with our uh, uh, friends at the city of Johnston. Uh, Gunnar, are you able to talk to this one initially? Happy to do so. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, as we've been starting to do recently, we are uh, highlighting and spotlighting um, projects of major significance around the region and asking our our representatives to give those presentations. Today, we're going to hear from David Willardine of Johnston about a project that's been in the works for a while on Highway 141. And I'll let Dave take over. All right, did my, uh, my screen share properly? Yes. OK, great. Um, well, thanks, uh, Steve, and thanks, Gunnar. Um, Gunnar asked that I just give a little update on kind of some activities that we've had going on on the 141 corridor. Um, this planning effort actually goes back, uh, started in 2021 and wrapped up in 2022, and then we were moving towards design of an interchange now. So um, just a little bit of background and overview. Um, uh, this study was a jointly funded study between the DOT, um, the cities of Johnston, Grimes, and Polk County, and we were really focusing in on the um, the portion of 141 between Iowa 44 um, and Iowa 415. I um, mean, look, the DOT has done a lot of work as you go to the north, um, uh, looking at some safety improvements at 121st. Um, and uh, so this was really focusing in on um, I, kind of the, right in between the two highways. Uh, this is a growth area for Johnston. Um, we've got um, annexed on both sides of 141 and really wanted to make sure before any development happened that we um, had a good plan for access management along the corridor. Um, we should mention Snyder and Associates was our engineer on the project and did um, the bulk of the work uh, where we started um, was actually laying out kind of the land use plans for both the cities of Johnston and Grimes on um, filling in for Polk County where there was an overlap um, to really look at what kind of, um, you know, future uses are expected in the corridor. Um, on the east side, um, we expect a, a fair amount of business park and employment focused. Um, sorry, my slides keep advancing here. Uh, business focused um, and uh, as well as some commercial. And so um, obviously the potential for some uh, residential as well, but um, definitely some traffic generator um, type uses in this corridor. 
Uh, using that uh, comprehensive plan information, then we then did some traffic forecasting. So uh, as you can see here, uh, existing, going back to 2019, existing AADT on the corridor in the 20 to 23,000 range. Um, the MPO's 2050 forecasts are in the 30 to 35,000 range. Um, um, but when we apply some, you know, changes to that land use, um, we're projecting um, um, projections between 45 and 70, a little just over 70,000 for this corridor. So um, a significant change from uh, current traffic volumes, and we want to make sure we're uh, planning and preparing uh, preparing for that. Uh, obviously, looking uh, at crash history, um, there have been, uh, I think at the time of the study, there were two fatalities in the corridor. Uh, there's been at least one more since the study has been done. So um, obviously, safety is you know paramount and, and adding extra traffic. We need to make sure we're continuing to uh, meet our safety targets there. Uh, so the outcome of the study uh, was a series of recommendations, and we broke these down into sort of every intersection point, um, a short-term improvement, a long-term improvement um, in, in sort of the, what's the ultimate and are there improvements that can be made along the way. Um, and you can see there, there's about 12 different areas that were intersections or locations that were looked at as, as far as improvements that could be made. Um, these are everything from, you know, closing right in, right outs to um, uh, adding uh, turn lane capacity, uh, uh, those types of things, closing intersections altogether. Um, long term also looked at the need that this corridor will ultimately need to be six lanes. Um, you know, it is partway um, now and we'll need to continue uh, going forward. Um, we'll also need to continue monitoring um, speed limits. It's, you know, likely a bulk of this corridor right now is 65 miles an hour and we'll likely have to come down to 55 at uh, at some point that'll have to have to be monitored. Uh, sort of the biggest, um, uh, at least the most expensive takeaway from the the study was the the need for um, an, um, a grade separated uh, interchange, um, generally in the location or to the south of Towner Drive. This would be the area of the um, Beaver Creek Golf Course. Um, this area um, is all within the city of Johnston on both sides of 141 in an area of significant growth uh, potential. And um, given the types of land uses, um, given the characteristics of the corridor I just talked about, um, a grade separated um, uh, interchange was determined necessary here. Um, this was the initial concept, just kind of laying it out, um, um, providing access to both sides. Um, as you can see, on the on the would be on the bottom of the screen, which is to the east. Um, our long term comprehensive plan does show a, a connecting north south street um, that would run parallel to 141. That's a pretty long term um, 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 idea or effort. Um, yeah, it would require a crossing of Beaver Creek. It would require about a half to three quarters of a mile of of roadway going through along the edge of Camp Dodge. So not a cheap or easy endeavor, but something we do have in our comp plan as a way to um, improve traffic flow and, and relieve a little pressure off of 141 here. Uh, as we work through uh, design, so uh, we completed the study. Um, the city of Johnson did enter into an agreement with the DOT and the city is designing the interchange. So we're going through um, alternatives analysis, environmental clearance, um, preliminary design um, currently, um, and then we'll turn those plans over to the DOT to construct the improvements um, when we get to that point. Um, we did jointly apply for a raise grant with Polk County on a, on a second project in this quarter. I'll, I'll show here in a minute. Uh, but going through that, um, those early alternatives analysis, um, what was identified pretty quickly and particularly to meet some of the raise requirements for safety um, was the idea of a, a kind of a dog bone roundabout uh, interchange concept. This allows us to keep a pretty um, uh, tight um, constraint on the right-of-way impacts to the adjoining properties um, and is, um, uh, provides a pretty, very safe um, um, access point, eliminates all the stoplights through that corridor. So uh, this was an early concept. We're continuing to refine that. This, sorry, I'm reoriented you to the north here, but um, 
uh, you know, working on uh, layouts with the property owners that match with uh, future development plans, as well as um, at least in the short term, maintaining operations on the on the golf course. Uh, the second part of that raised grant, and this is not a city project, but was um, proposed by Polk County, was um, actually the um, westerly extension of Highway 415 over to 121st, um, um, expanding that uh, existing interchange to make it a full interchange. Sorry, we're bouncing all over here. Um, and so that was part of the original raise application um, that was not funded the last round, but um, I would suspect we'll um, be back again um, come, going forward. So other improvements are planned um, by the DOT in that northern part of the corridor as well. Um, again, those don't fall necessarily within the, our jurisdiction, but um, we've all been working together to uh, improve safety along this corridor. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Dave. Is there any questions for Dave on, on this project? Okay, sure none. Uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate your time taking this. Uh, I was actually just out there last night. My boys go to that five one five field house, and and you are your traffic projections there. That traffic is definitely increasing out there, to say the least. So, uh, turns trying to turn into Beaver Brook Boulevard. I think the the two dual lefts were filling up in capacity, to say the least. So it's uh, definitely a need. Uh, so thank you so much for presenting this. Thank you. So, all right. That brings us to item number five, uh, report and a vote on calendar year 2024 meeting dates. Uh, Dylan, are you able to talk to this one? Yes, I can. As we do in November, we have meeting dates for the next calendar year, so uh, calendar year 2024 up there. Everything pretty much stays the same for the tech committee. The one exception is with July, 4th of July falls uh, close to the date, so everything's been pushed back a week that month, so it would be a week later than normal. Otherwise, we'd ask for your approval. Obviously, you're, you're just kind of approving the tech committee here. We'll take exec and policy to those different committees, but we're showing everything up here just so you have full awareness of what's going on. If there's any questions or if there's any conflicts that you're aware of, I know sometimes there's you know, public works conventions or, or conferences or so forth that conflict with dates. So if you notice any of those, please let us know and we can always adjust, but otherwise we'd ask for your approval. Does anyone know uh, to Dylan's question uh, when the spring APWA conference is? Uh, I, I can never remember that. I, I see that looking at that April 4th date. I don't know, maybe they haven't posted it yet. Uh, And if it something is does on come April up, 4th. we discover later. It is on April 4th. Oh, so Jeff May just said, yeah, it is on April 4th. So April 4th and 5th is the spring conference. Huh. I don't know. The Just out of curiosity, Dylan, is that something we could look at? You know, that's a big one for folks to, a lot of folks attend that one. And uh, uh, yeah, if we think that's going to affect, you know the ability to have quorum we can always find a different date it doesn't always have to fall on that you know that, that exact date so we can we don't have to decide that right now unless someone has a suggestion of, of what to look at we can go back to the calendar and, and find something else out um and so if that's the case unless someone wants to make a recommendation now of a different uh date you can approve everything and we'll we'll note that and we'll go back and find something and and come back with an alternate date for april meeting Quick recommendation would be to push it back one week, but I don't know if that interferes with other people's stuff. And I suppose they'll have to look. But anyway, the only I think if we pushed it back a week, um, we just wouldn't want it to be after the exec meeting because technically tech recommends to exec. Um, so that'd be the only thing there. But we could always have it like on Tuesday of that week instead of the Thursday like normal. Are we allowed to? Are we allowed to have it just out of curiosity on Thursday, the March twenty eighth? Or does it have to be in a calendar month? I guess I'm not. No, I I think you could do that. Just have two meetings in March, and I I think it assumes uh, that we'd have that we'd have I, things for March. But yeah, I would agree with Jeff. I think we we would have we would have a real hard time getting for them uh, for that one. Um, yeah. So I mean, I I guess I would be curious if we could do a a motion to 
I guess, could the motion be to um, approve the meeting dates as is with the uh, direction to staff to find an alternate time to the April 4th meeting and uh, or the other option is just to approve it with the April 4th being changed to March 28th. That's, I guess that's our two options, right? Right. I think if you want to do March 28th or if you want to do April 2nd or 1st, you know, we could do something in there as well. So whichever, whichever works best for people. Like if we know everyone likes March 28th, we can just change that now and not have to worry about coming back to it. Any comments on March 20th? The only little hesitation I have on moving it to like a Tuesday is, you know, people that may have like a consistent, you know, in schedule, like with may have a recurring Tuesday meeting where Thursdays could be maybe a little more, but I, I'm open to any discussion might, you know. I'll just put in that we can put a doodle poll in the follow-up meeting if that's helpful. Okay. All right. We don't have a lot of opinions, but maybe we'll, uh, I'll oh, start going. Mark. I was just going to suggest if you want to approve the slate and then we, with the motion that we can come back to that April 4th date and we'll put a doodle out like Gunnar suggested and see what works best for people. I would make a motion to approve the calendar as it as is with the exception of the April meeting. Okay. Mr. Rudy, I'll second. Thank you. All right. So we got a motion on the table to approve the calendar as is with the exception of April 4th. Uh, directing staff to find an alternate time. Uh, any questions or uh, discussions on this motion? Yeah, just one more question about uh, the potential for in-person meetings. Oh, yeah. I know it's just something we talked about before and maybe hard decisions weren't made, but just if there's any any feedback from the group on that. Dylan, I know we were we're ho we're hoping to have an in-person meeting coming up here. I think it kind of depends on the the thought was to wait till the the safety action plan has some more uh, need for discussion, and then so that could be pretty soon here. Or? Correct, and that was our initial plan for this month. And I don't know when Zach might be able to correct me uh, when the consultants think they'll have something ready. You know, we just didn't want to have a group to meet with no real information to look at. We wanted to make it more of a substantive meeting when we do get together in person with those consultants. Um, so maybe that'll be in December, but we do have the long range plan that we're gonna start kicking off. And Zach will talk about this later, but we don't have a, street, a steering committee for that plan. We really wanna rely on the tech committee to help us drive that plan, at least from the technical perspective. So I think it'll be important to start having more reoccurring meetings in person um, if the group's open to that. When those exactly fall, if it'll be every month or we try to find like an every other month type of thing or once a quarter, that's all to be determined. But uh, I guess to lose this question, I'd open that up to the group too to see, you know, is this still working? Do you want to do more in person? Do you want to kind of start rotating that back in? We're, we're flexible. We want to accommodate what works best for this group, but just want to put that out there. Yeah, I'll express a personal preference that I think it'd be good to get together. It doesn't have to be every meeting. I like the emphasis on those meetings that are going to be more collaborative in nature, because I think it'll just, it'll just spur that collaboration and the relationships. And and I'd be very curious if others have, have concerns about attendance or whatever, because obviously we want attendance to be up too. I know I would, I would echo uh, Luis's comments there. I, yeah, I think uh, I'd absolutely like to get together, especially, you know, when we have a agenda that requires that, that discussion so yeah i don't know if uh um so it sounds like maybe others we may need to be prepared to get together in december if that lines up with zach and the consultant schedule or at least you know whether it's december or january whenever they're ready but uh i i would like to get together at least you know maybe and i don't know what that number is maybe it's core at least four meetings a year in person or something like that you know We would try to make those in-person meetings substantive enough so that yeah. I know a lot of times these meetings can be fairly short. So we don't want people to spend more time right. getting to the meeting than the meeting actually lasts. So we would try right. to make it more you know, substantive to make it worth your time. Okay. 
All right. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. Well, yeah, I think that, I mean, hearing nothing, I, again, I, I'm with Luis. I, I hope we, we can, uh, Maybe when we look at the scheduled meet, when there is some substance, and again, like the first one being that when that the consultant for the Transportation Safety Action Plan is ready to meet, hopefully December, maybe it's January. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, any uh, anyone opposed to the motion of approving the calendar with the exception of the April 4th date? Okay, hearing none, that motion passes. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, that brings us to item number six, a report, a vote on the decision-making tree. Uh, Dylan, are you going to talk to this one? Please? Yes, I can talk about this. This is a, a topic that we have talked with the executive committee and the policy committee about for the last couple of months, and we wanted to bring it back and kind of loop you into this as well. Um, following some of our leadership transition, I've gone out and met with all of our policy committee members, and I've met with several of you as well, just to get a sense of where the MPO should be going and what we're working on and you know, to kind of settle some of the issues that we were having. And one thing that we kept coming back to and talking with our policy members, especially was just more clarity around what the MPO gets involved with and why we're doing certain things and why we're not maybe involved with other things. So what we've done is developed a decision-making tool, for lack of a better term, a decision tree to help us understand what, what activities we should be getting involved with. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that. And it's also in the agenda packet of what the actual, you know, tool actually looks like with. Um, but this is kind of help, especially our policy committee members, walk through and understand why, like I said, why why the MPO is leading in some some projects. So if you think of the Purple Art Highway interstate designation, that's something that, especially when our executive and policy committee meets, we talk a lot about that uh, and try to keep them on the loop. And we got some questions. Why are we always talking about that project, but we're not talking about, say, the Southeast Connector, which is also a very important project. And the reason to me and to our staff is that because the Purple Art Highway didn't really have anybody else leading that project. It, it's got eight different communities involved. So really there was no one taking the lead. So the MPO has stepped up and people look to the MPO to do that. Whereas maybe the Southeast Connector or the 141 project that uh, Dave just spoke about, you do have a strong project lead on those already. And the MPO doesn't need to play as much strong of a role. It can be more of a support role. So that's really what this tool is designed to do is to help understand where does the MPO lead? Where are we more supportive? And then what are kind of those one-off what we called supplemental, but these are just kind of the one-off things that maybe aren't regionally significant. Maybe they're just something that was requested by a member community that doesn't really affect everybody else, but it's still, you know, it can be transportation-based or it can be just something that they want to get out of being an MPO member, you know, some service they want out of that. So that was the purpose for this. And then on the next slide and on the back sheet, back side of the, the other sheet, it kind of gives a little more definition behind this. This also plays into a discussion that we've been having with, again, Exec and Policy Committee about potentially making our long-range plan a little more strategically driven. Um, so in other words, we have all the projects in the plan, but then identifying from those hundreds of projects that sometimes go into our long-range plan, which ones is the MPO really going to step up and try to drive forward? Again, because sometimes they're multi-jurisdictional. There's really no one that makes sense to do that, nor do a lot of times you as communities want to be the one in charge of a big multi you know jurisdictional project so is that something that the MPO should be more involved with in terms of driving those along in the project development and spending MPO dollars on potentially the studies and the design and so forth that goes into that versus putting that on the communities so that's kind of what this is all driving towards um, so like I said right now we just want to get feedback and potential approval on the tool itself to and again this is more on the executive and policy committee driving this but we want we didn't want to leave you out of this conversation either and then from there, we would start using this tool when we develop our annual work program to decide which projects is the MPO going to put into that work program as far as studies and um, research and that sort of thing. But then also, probably when we get to the long-range plan of identifying of all these hundreds of projects in the long-range plan, which ones are really going to stand out as the regional significant ones that the MPO gets more involved with in terms of funding or you know going after build grants or so forth that the MPO gets behind. Obviously, we just support the other communities with, with your projects as well. If there's questions about that, I'm happy to take them. I know this is kind of maybe abrupt in terms of when this is being brought to you, but like I said, we didn't want to leave you out of this conversation. And Dylan, these are specific, like for like kind of like new project initiatives, projects. This this would be an addition to like the the mod, the regional traffic model that you would all continue that be the main yeah. people doing that, but 
but this is like exactly. a, it's like a new initiative or new project that isn't currently in the exactly so this would be if a project comes forward and we as a region let's say we do the long range plan and we decide that there's a need for I don't, I don't even know what it would be you know come up with some new corridor that everyone agrees yeah there's something needs to be done on here but we we don't really know what it is maybe they turn to the MPO and say okay can you help let's start doing just kind of doing through that project development phase so let's do some initial planning and studies figure out what a funding situation might look like what are grants we can go after the MPO can help support all of that or, or kind of lead that effort if, if that's a desire or if someone else already you know we identify a big project on the west side that city of Waukee is really behind and they're going to drive it and then the MPO is just more providing letters of support that's that's kind of where we divide that just figure out that distinction of where is the MPO really getting involved here hope that makes sense mm -hmm. thank you yeah, I think it would. Uh, I appreciate. I like the transparency of it, and that kind of shows the committees the thought process of why. I think that kind of helps you all as staff with kind of like clarity or direction of how to tackle things, rather yeah. than just and someone a, a, yeah. a committee member or board member just asking you to do something, right? So right, and and this kind of goes back to as well, like I said, with some of the things the MPO is involved with, been involved with over the last couple of years of you know, MIPA or, or some of these other projects of, okay, let's walk that through this process. Is this really something that's for the MPO to do, or is this something best left to someone else? Um, so it also helps with those types of uh, issues too. Any other questions or comments on this for Dylan? Okay. Uh, is there any, uh, anyone uh, interesting, uh, motion and a second on approving this uh, decision making tree process. So moved, Husman. Thanks, Chelsea. Rudy, a second. Thank you, Rudy. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion or comments? Okay, hearing none, is anyone opposed to the motion? Hey, hearing none, that, that passes. Thank you, Dylan. All right, let's bring this to item number seven, uh, report on the planning area boundary update. Uh, Zach, are you able to talk to this, please? Yes, thank you. Um, staff is in the process of updating our planning area boundary. This is something we do um, each time that we update our long-range plan. As far as what that boundary has to encompass, it has to encompass the urban area boundary, um, which was approved back in September. And then it has to also account for all the future growth that we're anticipating over the next uh, 20 year period. Uh, so to work on this update, staff reviewed uh, comprehensive plans from the member governments to make sure that our planning area boundary was capturing um, all the areas that were in um, our member government's comprehensive plans. So if you go to the next slide, um, you can see a map here, um, the uh, Black line there is our current existing MPO planning area boundary. And then the red line is our proposed um, update to the planning area boundary. And if you go to the next slide, you can see a couple areas of emphasis there. Um, and looking at those comprehensive plans, we noticed that there were a handful of areas where we felt like we needed to make some changes to the planning area boundary, um, mostly um, in the south there uh, near Carlisle and then near Norwalk. Um, both of those communities have comprehensive plan areas that were going outside of our existing boundary. So we bumped them out in those areas to account for that. And then over um, in the west by Waukee, um, one thing we noticed is that um, Adele's boundary um, city limits had, had kind of moved into our planning area boundary. So we actually ended up backing our planning area uh, boundary off um, there just a little bit. Um, still capturing all the areas um, within Waukee's comprehensive plan, but not having um, Adele in our planning area. And then, you know, we adjusted a little bit to the to the north there, just to the north of Waukee. Um, those are the only uh, changes that we are proposing at this time. We would ask that you um, look over this map, see if um, you see anything that you would like to see changed um, from your community's perspective as far as where the planning area boundary is located and get us those comments by November 27th. 
and then we will have this back um, on our December agendas uh, for, for approval. Um, happy to take any questions if you have any. Okay, again, just to reiterate, it sounds like uh, you know Zach is looking for comments by November 27th, 27th, right? 27th, um, yep. And so comments by November 27th. Is there any questions or comments on this now from First Reaction or questions for Zach? Okay. Here you know, if you if you take a look at this and you talk it over with your colleagues, uh, any comments, questions, please get them to Zach before November 27th. So, all right. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to item number eight. Uh, this is a report, a report on mobilizing tomorrow update. Zach, are you able to talk to this one too, please? Yes, thank you. So we had a couple of things that we wanted to discuss regarding the uh, LRTP update. Um, most Mostly we'll talk today about the uh, funding projections, but also want to touch briefly on the growth scenario and project solicitation, a couple of things that will be coming up here um, shortly. So if you advance the next slide, getting into the funding projections, the uh, there are new federal guidance out on uh, fiscal constraint and the long-range plan. So in the past, we had to have fiscal constraint over the whole period of our long range plan and now it has been changed to just having to cover the first 10 years of the long range plan. Um, so based on that staff has began begun to develop funding projections um, for that first 10 year period of our long range plan update, which would be 2025 through 2034. And the funding sources that we've been looking at this include federal and state funding as well as local funding. So we're looking at our STBG funding, our TAP funding, our carbon reduction program funding. Um, on the state side, we're looking at the road use tax fund. And then on the local side, we're looking at property taxes and bonds and things of that nature. Uh, so going into the next slide here, looking at those federal funding sources, um, what staff did was we went back to, uh, we took historical data going back to 2015 to determine an annual growth rate for both the STBG and the TAP programs. With carbon reduction program being a new program, we don't have really any historical data to look at to de determine a uh, annual growth rate on that. So what we did was we looked at the five-year targets that the DOT has provided us and used those to give us a growth rate over those five years. And we feel like that's kind of the, the most accurate we can get on those at this time. But if you look at the uh, table there on the screen, you can see that um, the historical growth rate for STBG was a little over 2.6% over that 10-year period. For TAP, it was just under 2.5%. And then the carbon reduction funds were just a little bit under 1% at 0 0.8. Um, we typically look at these historical rates, and then we develop a uh, annual growth rate for the plan. What staff is recommending is that we use a 2.5% growth rate for both the STBG and the TAP programs, and then a, point, a 0 0.5%. Uh, percent um, increase for the carbon reduction program. Uh, moving on to oh. hey, hey Zach, I, so the the two point the two point six six that that's what we have got or we received. That's like the actual. That's uh, what we've actually observed over the last ten years. Yep. Because because you know the DOT just published a. Uh, they they keep track of a uh, construction price in indexes, and they just published a graph that showed between 2016 and 2023, so pretty close to the time frame. And that time frame alone, now your, yours is annualized, but they had, well, you got there to the 26.6, but they had 53% in terms of the the cost of of construction yeah. materials increasing. So, so the 26, you know, we're not even half of. Uh, keeping up with the cost of our projects, but but that's just what we 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 get and we we're stuck with. Is that correct or that's that's correct? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. I just that's obviously going to make it more. A, we're seeing the numbers to make it challenging from a. Uh, we're I mean we're doing less, or so we're, we're gonna have we're gonna have to do less. Right. The, the federal getting... funding sources aren't keeping up with the costs. That's for sure. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so on the next slide, we get into the road use tax funds. Um, we uh, went back and looked at historical data on that from 2017 to 2023 to determine that annual growth rate. 
Um, it was the historical rate was a little over three percent. Um, we're proposing that we go with a two point five uh, percent growth rate on that. And you know, I will note the reason we're doing that is we just want to be a little conservative. The DOT usually um, appreciates a more conservative approach on funding projections. Um, I will note that we will be taking these all through the finance subcommittee as well to get their recommendation on uh, what we go with on these growth rates. But as of right now, what staff is proposing is that we go with a 2.5% growth rate on the road use tax funds. And then moving on into the local funds, uh, staff, look, staff looked at the DOT's street finance reports to pull data for uh, local funding. Um, local funding is a little bit different and trickier for us to project out. Um, looking at those street finance reports, there's a lot of fluctuation in how communities and when communities are using their bonding. Um, so we get some really weird numbers when we just do, when we just look at, you know, a uh, period of time. Uh, so what we did here um, instead was we looked at kind of what the four-year average was for uh, local funding being spent on transportation. And if you look at the table there below, you can see kind of what those totals were for 2020 through 2023, um, what the overall total was. And we developed a four-year average there, which was uh, $386 million as an as an annual average for what's being spent on transportation in the region. So our proposal is to use that number um, to do our projections and in keeping with what we've done in our last long range plan, and we'll see what the finance committee has to say about this. But last time they recommended that we use a 0% growth rate on local funding, just because of a lot of the things that have been happening um, at the state with new laws and rules around property taxes and things of that nature. Um, so we'll see what they say when we present it to them next week. But as of right now, we're going to go with a 0% growth rate on the local funding. Zach, do you, you, know, you didn't show 2015 or 20, or back to 2017. Is that uh, just out of curiosity? Or is, I was curious to see what those would be because I, I feel like there was a spike. You know, being, I, my speculation is, is 2017 and 2015 would be much lower, but maybe I'm... Yeah. You know, we um we could yeah, go back and look at that if you'd like us to. We uh, were pulling from the, as I mentioned, the street finance reports and on their DOT's website, they go back four years. So that's, that okay. was the available data we had readily available to us. We could probably get that information from them if if you would like us to, but that's what was it, just readily available. And I would agree you wouldn't use it necessarily for your projections because it's yeah. you know longer, but I was, just, I was just curious if you, so you, that, that it could be available, but it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. No, it's, it's good. I just, was curious from an overall spending standpoint of yeah. you know, workload and stuff, but thank you. So as far as the projections go for funding, looking at 2025 through 2034, um, we will be using that annual growth rate um, once we send it through the finance committee and they give us their recommendation on that. Um, we will be doing a straight line projection on these. So what we'll do is we'll use that um, annual uh, growth rate to determine an annual funding increase. And then we will just add that funding increase each year um, to get that straight line projection. Um, I would also note that historically, looking at those street finance reports, we uh, have seen that about 40% of the local funding that is available for transportation is actually being spent on construction projects. The other 60% is being used to cover debt service and um, maintenance and things of that nature. Um, so what we have done in our projections is we've taken that 60% out. Um, so if you look at the table there before, you can see the two different time periods we have, 2025 through 2029 and 2030 through 2034. Um, all the numbers in this table are in millions. So if you look at that, what we're estimating um, for that 10-year time period is that we're going to have a little over 2.5 billion dollars available um, in funding for transportation projects. Um, so that's where we're at right now um, with those uh, funding projections. I think on the next slide, I've got some next steps. Um, as I mentioned, we will be taking this to the finance subcommittee for them to review and provide us comments on those growth rates. Um, they meet on November 6th. We're also going to share this with the Iowa DOT to get their comments and feedback. And then our plan would be to bring this back to our December meetings um, to be voted on. 
Um, I would also additionally note that at this point, they do not include um, Iowa DOT funding, um, state funding on those kind of facilities, and then also DART funding for transit. So we will be reaching out to staff from both uh, DOT and DART to work with them to get their projections ironed out as well. Um, but what we're just focusing on right now are the funds that the NPO controls. Any questions on that before I move on to these other two items? Doesn't sound like it. Um, so the other two items I wanted to briefly touch on regarding the long-range plan um, are the growth scenario and project solicitation. Both of these things will be happening, happening in the upcoming months. Um, as Dylan mentioned, since we don't have a steering committee, we will be relying pretty heavily on this committee to help us with these uh, kind of things. Um, as far as the growth scenario goes, um, staff is in the process of developing our projections for housing and employment, and then finalizing our uh, TAZs, our trans transportation analysis zones. Um, and our plan is to distribute a TAZ shapefile map to each of our member governments along with their share of the housing and employment projections. And then we'll be asking them to fill in um, those TAZs and then send them back to us so we can compile those all together into our growth scenario. This is a little bit different than how we have done it the past couple of uh, long range plan updates, but we feel like this will be a little bit more of a streamlined uh, process. As far as project solicitation goes, this will also be happening in the next few months. Uh, we'll be developing a Google form to collect those projects for the LRTP. And uh, as I mentioned before, because they have changed that fiscal constraint to just the first 10 year time period, um, that's the time period that we'll be collecting uh, projects for. So we'll be looking to collect projects for just the 2025 through 2024 um, time period. I think that's all I have on the long range plan update. If you have any questions, I would be uh, happy to take them. Thanks, Zach. Any questions for Zach? Hey, hey, no, thank you, Zach. Thank you. All right, that takes us to number item nine. Uh, oh, wait a minute here. I think we, we do have a question up here. Um, Sriani, uh, I wonder about how the plan for designing transit-oriented development in the Metropolitan Des Moines. Um, about how the plan for design. I don't know. Sriani, I don't know if we, uh, Zach, do you have any thoughts or maybe a clarification on the question? Let me see if I can pull it up. I... So we don't have a, uh, at this time, we don't have a specific plan for that. Um, it really is kind of driven by the communities and what they decide to submit to us um, in that uh, project solicitation process. So if there are communities who are wanting to do more transit oriented type development, they would submit those projects to us as part of that overall long range planning project. Um, based on the way we look at projects and score them oftentimes, those projects would probably uh, score very well and do well on the plan, but it is really kind of driven by uh, what the communities mm -hmm. submit to us. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Shirani, and thank you, Zach. Any other questions for Zach? Okay, that brings us to item number nine, a report on the federal fiscal year 2028 Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, SDBG, schedule. Zach, are you able to talk to this? Yes, thank you. Uh, just a quick update for you on the schedule for SDBG funding for the federal fiscal year 2028 cycle. Um, we'll be posting those applications as we always do on our website on December 1st. And then we'll have those applications due back to us uh, by January 5th. And then we'll proceed with the applicant presentation sometime probably in late February, early March. We have not got that scheduled yet, but uh, be on the lookout for when those dates are scheduled. Um, I would note that um, staff is currently in the process of reviewing and updating our program guidelines for the TAP program. Um, this is based on changes the Iowa DOT has made. 
you might recall that we did not award TAP funding last year because the DOT was reviewing that program. Um, we will be awarding two years, last year's allocation, as well as this year's allocation. We are uh, tweaking our guidelines based on feedback from the DOT. Um, but otherwise, TAP will be following the same timeline as the STBG program. Just want to make you aware of those dates that are coming up on that. I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. All right, Zach, just to read it. So this, the TAP would be the would be the December 1st and January 5th as well? Correct. Okay, yeah. good to know. Thank you. Yeah. And there would be twice as much TAP money than yes. in the past because yeah. it was two years. Okay. Any questions hey, Zach? for Zach? Jack, this is Mark Miller with the City of Ankeny. How about the carbon reduction program application? I thought that was going to run on the concurrent timeline. Yes. No, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I meant to hit on that when we we're talking about the long range plan. Uh, we had had some discussions with the executive committee um, about how we handled that program, whether or not we award it all out now. Uh, they were inclined to have us hold off and do a more thorough discussion in the long range plan about how we might spend that funding. Um, however, we have had some conversations with the DOT since then, and they are encouraging us to at least potentially ward out a couple years of that funding. Um, so I think we still have some discussions to have in regards to that, but um, it's looking like there is a good possibility that we will be awarding some of those carbon reduction funds in this uh, next cycle. But as far as how we approach that application process, we still need to have some discussions internally to figure that out. Thank you. So that, Zach, we don't you don't think that the carbon reduction this will be on the same timeline. I just didn't know if that would be helpful from my I think community planning we will, standpoint. Or... We'll definitely put it on the same timeline. We just oh. need to have some more clarity with the DOT on how how we approach that and we need to circle back with exec to, to let them know what we've heard back from the DOT as far as how they want us to, how they want to see us award those funds. Cause initially exec wanted us to hold off and have a kind of more strategic discussion about how we spend that money. But again, based on what we've heard from the DOT, we might not be able to do that. Okay. No, thank you. I just didn't know how that that could impact, you know, decision making on what people apply for and what, you know, maybe how awards go to even. I don't know, you know, if there's some overlap or at all or, you know. We will try our best to get that sorted out as soon as we can so we can make an announcement on whether or not we're going to uh, have that funding available in this round. Thank you. Well, either way, at least people know that it sounds like there's a round coming. So that's just something to be a cognizant of as you uh, prepare these that, you know, that that program's out there as well. So, um, you know, so. Okay. Thank you, Zach. All right. Any other questions for Zach? Okay, thank you. That brings us to item number 10, a water trails build grant update. Zach, are you taking this one as well? I am. This is the last one for me today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here while I give you this presentation on this. Uh, we felt like it had been a while since we had given you an update on where we're at with water trails. I hope all of you can see my screen now. You should be able to see a, a live feed of the construction site. <clears throat> can you see that? Okay. So if you look there, um, <clears throat> the work that's been happening kind of since July, a lot of uh, groundwork um, has been completed. Excuse me. In the background there, um, they've done a lot of grading and stuff on that bank there. And then more so in the foreground, they've been working on getting the riprap in, working on the maintenance path and the trail area there. <clears throat> I think the most predominant thing that stands out right now is they have just now started getting their crane mobilized to drive these sheet piles in the river. And I think you're really starting to be able to kind of see the what's happening in the water there take shape. Um, earlier on in the summer, the water levels were a little high for them to be really be able to get in there. Uh, right now, it's low enough that they don't have to do a coffer dam to get in there and drive those sheet piles. So um, they're in there right now doing that. Um, 
that is an area where they're driving their sheet pile so they can put in the cascading drops. And those are kind of the really the big element of this portion of uh, the water trails project. So we definitely want to let you see this. Um, again, it's a live feed that they have going on the site um, every day. And it's just kind of neat to be able to see um, the progress they're making over time. Um, the other thing that I would <clears throat> update you on as far as water trails goes is that we had the letting for the Harriet Street portion of the project on October 17th. Um, we received five bids. Um, all of them were under the engineer's estimate of $3.4 um, million. Uh, PCI right now is the apparent low bidder at $1.7 million. Um, the MPO will be holding a public hearing on November 16th. Um, to award that uh, construction contract. So just wanted to make you aware of kind of what's been going on with water trails over the last few months, as well as um, what we uh, what we had going with the Harriet Street uh, project. So happy to take any questions you have, but just wanted to provide you with that update. Thank you, Zach. Any questions for Zach on this project? Where's the, just out of curiosity, or is it not, should it not be disclosed? Where's the camera mounted for this? I can't remember the name of the building it is on. Maybe is it Dylan Eagle View Lofts? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yep, oh, that's right. okay. Yep. Nice. Okay. Just want to make sure it wasn't like a mid-am pull or something like that. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, but it's on the top there. <laughs> All right. And it's a funny story. Uh, some wasps built a nest right on it earlier in the summer. So for a while, you just had these giant wasps would be flying right into the camera every once in a while. So they're gone now. Nice. All right. Thanks, Zach. Very cool. Thank, Thank you. you. And that and that link, is that linked to that webcam on the website, did you say? Or it's um on icons website. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. On icons website. Okay. If you guys would like that link, we can we can get that out to you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, that brings us to item number 11, a report. Oops, sorry. Report on upcoming events. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. No worries. Yeah. All right. Z, are you able to talk to uh, item 11, upcoming events? Yep, I can. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We have some upcoming webinars and events for you. Uh, the, most of them are in your agenda packets, but I want to highlight some upcoming ones for this month. Uh, of note, in uh, in the next week or two, uh, in Ames and in Indianola, the mostly ISU events, ISU will have a traffic and safety forum, as well as a municipal street seminar and a winter maintenance workshop. Um, if you have any questions on these webinars or upcoming events, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Z. Any questions on, on any of these? All right. Thank you, Z. Hey, and uh, brings us to item number 12, other non-action items of interest to the committee. Or any other items? Okay, hearing none, that moves us to item 13. Our next meeting date will be December 7th, 2023 at 9.30 in the morning. All right, we'll consider that, uh, that brings us to item 14. We will consider this uh, November 2nd, uh, 2023 Transportation Technical Committee meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.